Well, we're going to talk today about natural motivations. What are they? How do they uh, play a role in our movements? Um, and so natural motivations is kind of how I describe what's behind what moves us as people. Movements are about mobilizing people around shared purpose. Essentially, more than anything, we're hopefully we're advancing like a kingdom movement. Uh, in our communities, and uh, but it's it's about mobilizing people. Movements are decentralized networks of teams, really working together to, through an ecosystem of mutual support. And I like using the word ecosystem because it's a very organic process in how we move people. This is kind of if you had to draw what an ecosystem looks like, uh, this is what it might look like. This is truly our ecosystem in San Antonio, where we have. Uh, people from 11 different sectors representing the larger circles. All the little smaller dots are the smaller. These represent the unique roles that people are in in each of those sectors. So uh, so in the uh, education community, we have principals, we have family engagement specialists. Those are different roles that people are in that we can engage with in the education sector. Uh, so, you know, we're advancing in movement, and it's important to think about each of the roles, because in a movement, each of us has a unique highest and best role to play. There's there's a really important role that a church leader can play that's very different than a school leader, that, that again, is a different than a business leader. There's a highest and role, best role that each of us play in our community to be collectively and collaboratively working together towards strengthening marriages. And so these are some of the ordinary roles that you are very aware of uh, that people are in in the church setting. One of the things I want us to focus on right now is to really realize that each role is driven by a unique set of natural motivations. And why is that important? It's because motivations are the energy of movements. This is what makes movements happen is this energy. And so from a very practical standpoint, uh, people invest time in what advances their natural motivations. And a lot of times, you know, people tell us no, <laughs> like yes. uh, for whatever reason, they tell us no. And I remind myself uh, that no doesn't mean that they really don't want to be a part of serving marriages. It's, it's really, it becomes my responsibility to speak to their natural motivations. What are the, What are they driven by? Look, I'm driven by the, ultimately by the desire to serve and strengthen families by strategically investing in marriages, but other people are driven by different things. Uh, and so you have to really understand what, what really drives them. What are the, the natural motivations that are behind them? So what, what might this be? Well, a senior pastor most often is driven by the motivations of evangelism and discipleship. Uh, a church staff member might be excited about developing and running vibrant programs. Uh, lay couples. Now, lay couples are very uh, focused on serving marriages and families directly. So those are just some of the things that I know you see in local churches. But I want to go a little bit deeper still, and I want to talk about the different types of motivations that are uh, that are part of all of us. Our motivations can be external or internal. What do I mean by that? Uh, this is an organization, SEMA International is an organization, and they study the social science of what they call motivated abilities. And, uh, and this is what they have to say about motivations. They say that motivations are the driving forces behind our actions. They can be internal, meaning in, intrinsic, or they can be external or extrinsic. The intrinsic motivations come from within like a desire for personal growth or a sense of purpose, whereas external motivations are external rewards or pressures or recognition or maybe even financial incentives. Obviously, they're talking about the broader range, you know, that could even include business. But one of the things I really like that they focus on is that every person has been endowed with a uniquely motivated and purposeful behavioral pattern. And even more important than that statement is this, is that when people live and work in accordance with their pattern, they experience remarkably productive and meaningful lives. That's our opportunity, is to point people to a unique way that they can serve marriages, even if they don't feel called to serve marriages. A lot of times there is a, a, a secondary purpose for their serving marriages, like 
let's say a, a family engagement specialist at a church at a school there they don't serve marriages but they do know that strong marriages create strong families and strong families have very motivated kids in the academic world so uh so we're helping people uh be more effective in their work or in their passion so these external motivations might be like to have a growing church again a vibrant program but generally speaking the external motivations are about like recognition or rewards or interests uh there's a great church in indianapolis that has done a marvelous job of recruiting hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and they have a really unique method of using external motivations when when a when a a, a person volunteers at their church and proves themselves to be very reliable and very effective in a volunteer role they give them three things they give them an official church name badge they give them an official church email address and believe it or not they give them a key to the church and this is not a little bitty church this is a great big church and th that demonstrates an external reward you can imagine what that would feel like if you've been volunteering at church and you get these external rewards that really reinforces your behavior it feels good right and that was what was behind Nehemiah. Nehemiah is always referred to in the Old Testament as this great leader, a model of leadership. And he understood the importance of these external motivations. And you remember in the story, the rebuilding of the temple, he asked people to take care of the walls that were near their own house, because that was a, a motivation for them, uh, even though it was external. But now let's talk about internal motivations, because actually these are the more powerful ways that uh, that we can tap into the heart of where people are. The, our internal motivations very often are driven by pain or redemption or purpose. Natural motivations are often rooted in pain and they're what is called gospel reversals. And you've heard this preached from the pulpit before. You know, you've heard a pastor say that your struggle becomes your strength. Your mess becomes your message. Your test becomes your testimony. You've heard those forms of, of messages. But more than anything, using your pain as a form of redemption brings a redemptive form of purpose to our suffering, right? It, in other words, it transforms your suffering uh, to a place of meaning. And this is where the motivations, the, the most important motivations, a lot of times grow out of our suffering, right? And this is a guy who knew a lot about suffering, Victor Frankl, and spent time in a in a in a in a prison. And uh, and can you imagine how you could find some sort of redemption nature to being in prison? But he says that if we can find some meaning to put at the center of our lives, even the worst kind of suffering becomes bearable. Uh, and this is a, yet another uh, mess. Uh, this is another quote from uh, internal motivations. Uh, th this lady in this book is talking about how uh, we use external motivations too much, especially in the business world. We use financial incentives too much in the business world. And she's pointing people to the fact that the, the most important motivations are those very internal motivations. And she says, at its core, true motivation is more about internal fulfillment than external incentives. It's driven by our personal values, our passions, and a sense of purpose. I think that really speaks a lot. But this is really what I want us to camp out on, is that there is a form of redemption at the deepest place of human experience when we find purpose for our pain. I think ultimately that's what we're talking about here. That's what's at the, the very core or at the root of the, the the internal things that really drive us so thinking of this from the context of a movement maker is it's important for a movement maker to be able to articulate the pain you know martin luther king he was able to in, articulate the pain of people who were marginalized in their communities he was able to ar articulate the pain of what it felt like to be excluded to not be allowed to ride on a bus, to not be served lunch at a counter. He was he was a master storyteller of the pain that people experienced. It wasn't necessarily his pain. It was the pain of the people that he met along the way. 
So let's remind ourselves that you know, some people are motivated by data and logic, incentives and impact, and really all of us are. We're motivated by that in, in a lot of ways. But more than anything, we're, we are motivated by stories of redemption. And so as your role as, as a movement leader, your job is to be a masterful storyteller of the pain or even the very private pain of couples and children in your community. And there's so much that we can learn from this whole world of storytelling. Um, uh, we've had the question, you know, uh, do you tell people's personal stories? Absolutely not. <laughs> you don't tell people's personal stories. Those are very private uh, matters, but you can tell composite stories. And composite stories are stories that are assembled uh, or represent a lot of the pain that you see. Certainly, you're going to change the names of the people, but sometimes you need to change the circumstances as well because you want to protect the people and their personal stories. Uh, but more than anything, you want to think of the different ways that you can tell the stories. You want to, do you want to tell the story from the context or the, or the lens of a child? Do you want to tell it from the story of a spouse who was betrayed uh, do you want to tell it from the story of a spouse who lost another spouse through death? Uh, how do you want to, what's the lens that you want to tell the story through? Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about storytelling is just some of the techniques of storytelling. And storytelling, uh, one of the, the most essential parts of storytelling is pace, is that you you can't tell someone's entire 10-year story, right? <laughs> You've got to you got to move very quickly through the very high level facts, but there are, there are places in the journey of telling a story that you need to slow down. And especially you need to slow down when you tell the, the part of the story where someone is at their absolute lowest moment. What was it like in their darkest hour? You know, the, the technique of storytelling is called show, don't tell. In other words, help someone experience what it was like for someone you saw to go through that. You've probably told your own story and you've probably told your own story of pain. We all have challenges that we face in our marriages. And so there's these critical moments that we have to slow down in our storytelling so that people can have enough time to experience what someone else has experienced. And when they experience that, that gives people a deep sense of compassion for others. And then that sense of compassion can often be the thing that might motivate someone to take action. So natural motivations are the energy of movements. It's what gets people up and out of the bed in the morning. It's what moves people towards action. And it's and telling the story uh, of this is uh, what can help us energize the movements in our communities.